bachelor of Thomas Bulfinch, Latinist for Bulfinch's mythology, and noted anti-homosexual activist, and his pupil Maxie, whom he had himself buried beside. 1850s Boston, Maxie and Bulfinch are both played by the same actor. unseen like the festering humanoids which our Boston streets foist upon us daily. The Chinese sunk in the miasma of their opium dens and plain still the city council embraces them. The native savages who taunt us with their ungodliness, at least they had been marched back west to their pit. The whorehouse women possessed by their implacable and unslakable lusts, but worse, far worse. Masquerading as one of our kind, they pass among 
promise, unseen, except to each other, as they exchange the thousand and one telltale signs advertising their particular place in the firmament of blasphemy. Have you ever heard the queer inflection of a word? A folded handkerchief tucked obliquely in an uncommon pocket. The superfluous angular gestures molding the air between two seemingly God-fearing men. These are the signs and the sigils of their pervert's tongue, their pederast prayer, their pedophile's creed, which mixes lasciviously with the king's English here on the very streets that will see you home this evening. They speak of Boston's blighted under twin, her derelict double, which nightly of underground passages with a homosexual class mixed with the sewage and the rats and they pray. Yes, they pray to what we dare not lend words, but pray they do as they, as they dance around effigies built out of their own feces. They pray as they hoard diseases of the flesh like, like dragons squatting on their gold. They pray that the thousand and one strains of contagion that wriggle and writhe beneath their petticoats will fester and mingle into hitherto unimagined abominations and open the way for their new black Eden to rise! Dear Mr. Bullfinch, my name is Matthew Edwards, I saw you read your translation of Ovid, Theseus, and the Minotaur, and it, it filled me with uh, a brilliant dread. I've never heard of Ovid's tales rendered into such uh, direct, simple, not, not uninteresting, but unencumbered English. And familiar, I, 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 I could have spoken the words along with you even though I had never heard them before. I know that pit, that descending staircase, the labored breathing within the concealed night. Is Latin the language of dreaming? Every time I read one of your translations, it feels inked with my own blood, with my bones for a stylus. Dear Mr. Edwards, <laughs> I realize that you were speaking poetically, but oddly enough, I do dream in Latin. I realize this sounds fanciful, but my dreams contain none of vocabulary that we are now exchanging, none of these awkward English syllables chasing each other around in circles. When I dream, the nightmare creatures writhe and grasp, but when they speak, they do so in the language of The cries are wretched, their, 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 their shrieks are horrific, but their grammar is impeccable. Mr. Dear Mr. Bullfinch, I knew it, I knew that your dreams entangled with these stories. One can hear it in the verse. I was arrested by the portrait of Will that you paint in Theseus. He heard of an underground labyrinth beneath a haunted city inhabited by an unseen creature, and he saw within all of this his own nightmare, his every interlocking terror all bound in one figure, a horned beast heaving in the dark. So he fled not away, but towards his own unknowable darkness, and plunged his sword in it. Such a man no horror Yes, indeed, but Theseus is also untested in his father's eyes. He must prove above all else that he is his father's son. And besides, Ariadne's promise of marriage hangs by a thread, so to speak, <laughs> of his success. Even a confirmed bachelor such as myself can recall the effect of such a woman on a young man.
But in all this idle chat of dreaming, you are best to recall there are very real beasts haunting the streets of Boston. Head down the wrong road tonight and you'll wish for a good knife in hand. Oh no, no. Uh, uh, surely Ovid points us towards a minotaur of the mind, not of the alley. A, a minotaur is, after all, half beast, half man, meaning that it is ultimately human. The human dream of being human. A, a minotaur is, after all, tears itself in two, reaching down for the flesh and up for the spirit. Mere knives cannot cut such stuff. The Romans were always talking about their dualities. They always seemed to be pointing towards something larger, although I myself cannot guess what. You said yourself, myth is the fever dream of history. What dream is this? And who is dreaming it? And are we awake enough to know the difference? Like uh, Hermaphroditus, half Hermes, half Aphrodite, the man and the woman, in one, combined. That's enough! I will ask you to refrain from committing such thoughts to paper. And this one in English. Hermaphroditus and Ganymede and the rest all comprise their own Pandora's box, and it is for us Latinists to keep this well sealed. You said yourself, these tales require expurgation. We are not leaving the Ovid out of Ovid. Ovid wrote these stories for the people of his time. These omissions will make that true of ours. Melum inquisitum submanit. I wish we had spoken further the evening of the lecture. I remember your face. It was not a large crowd, and, and yours was unfamiliar to me, sporting your dark mustache. Boston society has more conversation now in pig Latin than Latin. Perhaps you and I could balance the scales. Oh, no. I'm afraid you are mistaken. I cannot grow a mustache, at least not a decent one. As for my Latin, I have only the Latin that the poor education of the grammar school would allow. That and the Latin that one learns at the feet of an actor. While the other boys were out minding their father's shops, I was helping my father run lines. He learned his Latin from the, performing the plays of Plautus and Terence, and he delighted in them. That fire burns in my veins as well. My father told me that the poor, watered-down texts that we see are nothing like the original Latin. That's why I sought you out. I cannot read them. I have only your translations. Are there more of them? I said about these translations because I, too, could not find any others. I had the ambition of writing a full English-language translation of the myths who work as as vivid and direct and monstrous as the Latin that it sprang from, not the stolid academic verses that we all encountered in grammar school. There's never been a more concerted effort to prove that Latin is the language of drudgery. When I turn a page of Ovid, it's like one page is flint and the other is steel, and it sparks, the book bursts into flame, and it shoots up my arms, and I burn, and I burn. Also burn. Perhaps you and I could meet in person. If you are so inclined. I would love to. I know the perfect place. The Taurus Inn. The sign of the horns. It must be a very, very brief lunch, though unfortunately my father is very ill and I cannot be away from him for very long. Ha! The Taurus Inn. That would be particularly apt. Postscriptum. Uh, you asked me about uh, translations. I was inspired by our exchanges, and I had attempted a brief pass at the Pygmalion myth from Ovid. The 
This is that strange for all of it. I'm not sure if I've quite got it right, but I have touched my translation. <coughs> This is the translation of what fantastical stuff is the original. I am desperate to know the source, to know the thing itself, and not the story of the thing. Will you teach me? I have taken up the Pygmalion from Ovid, as you did, and attempted a very <coughs> meager, translation of my own. One son, Zeus, survived and slew his father to become king of the sky. His son was prophesied to become greater than he, so Zeus ate his wife to keep him from being born. Scan the meter. Render all historical infinitives into syntactic and appropriate finite forms. For every verb within that set of finite forms, provide a full paragraph. why you don't need so many in Latin. I am sitting, sedeo. Done. Speaking English is like sleepwalking. It takes so long to get to where you're going that by the time you arrive, you don't know why you're there. In Latin, we know where we are so quickly, we are forced face to face with the question, what is it that you have to say? Is it you? My Latin tutor begs it. I 
carry my candle for him. I saw your father perform once at the Bijou Theater. I was going to attend the tragedy, Macbeth, and it was followed afterwards by a burlesque version of that same show where your father played Lady Macbeth. The long train on his dress stole the show. This was when those ludicrously long trains after the inveterately ridiculous French fashion were popular in ladies' dresses. His stretch from one end of the stray stage straight to the other. During the scene, he would so entangle himself walking around the set that when he exited, half the set exited with him. But it was his out damn spot that stole the show. He had these um, sores or splotches applied with makeup, covering his hands and his arms, which I could not comprehend until the final act, when out damn spot became an invective against the chicken pox. He, he fled around the stage, rushing, clucking, and pecking the pox off of his arms, and the crowd roared. But when he managed to exit, while towing off all of Macbeth's castle with him, it was done. We could laugh no more. He, his capacity to transfigure his suffering into our laughter was unforgettable. When I saw those marks on his hands, I didn't think about the chicken pox at all. I thought about, I thought about my skin seer back at Exeter. I thought about holding my candle. Yes, the wax. Of course it drips. Dripping is the point, don't. him perform from the wings. Unless you saw him perform from there, you couldn't understand what he was. He, at least on stage, people had some sense of what he was going to do next. There were lines, they had rehearsed. It was off stage that he was completely untethered. It began at home. He dressed up and walked right through the downtown wearing his full Lady Macbeth costume with the train dragging behind him, alternately incensing and attracting a crowd as he went. They reviled him, adored him, spat at him, sang for him, held his train so that it would not be soiled, spilled sewage on his path so that it would, threw fresh flowers and rotten fruit, and for everything they hurled at him, he gave it back with interest. The night's receipts were often doubled due to this effort alone. Perhaps you saw a piece 
uh, as part of the vaudeville uh, offerings from the Bijou Theatre called the Sopranothon, about the singer racing with the orchestra. My father is not in that piece, but it came about because of him. He was backstage one night, attempting to make his fellow players in the wings wet themselves with laughter. Now, I mean this quite precisely. If they held their urine, he considered it a failure, as he did every night while an opera singer was out performing her set. She had been backstage listening to my father carry on and carry on. Her cue was called, so she went on, but all she really wanted to do was get off stage again so she could hear my father carry on some. She rushed her arm. The conductor, of course, knew exactly what was going on. This happened every single night, and he was sick to death of it. So he did not speed up the tempo. He doubled it. <laughs> so she babbled to try to keep up with him, and the second she did keep up with him, he doubled it again. <laughs> of course, the crowd, having absolutely no idea what was going on, roared, just slayed themselves with laughter. None more so than my father and all the offstage players. So she got off stage, breathless, utterly humiliated, <laughs> and went off in order to strangle him. But the crowd roared so much that she was compelled to go back on stage again. So she went for a second time to kill him, but the crowd would have none of her leaving. So, first she went back to kill him, and then to scold him, and then to reproach him. And by the time she went off for her seventh and final curtain call, she just kissed him <laughs> for delivering to her the single funniest moment of her career. They called it the Sopranothon. <laughs> and the crowds still demand it every single night. There is a mad and unknowable thing that looms in every theater, and on some unknowable night, it descends upon the crowd and cracks the hardest souls open with laughter. And it obeys no one except my father. That bit that you saw, that was creativity wrought by necessity. The makeup was not on my father's hands, the makeup was on his face, so that you couldn't see that the, the sores were there too. The syphilis had spread everywhere. For every inch that it sprawled across his chest and legs, he seemed to get funnier, as if he could, how did you put it, convert his suffering into your laughter? It, infused his work with a kind of comic genius and elevated it to a level of hysterical genius. The same people came every single night just to see what on earth he was going to do next. Last night, he showed them just how far he could take it. He screamed, out, damn, pox, grabbed the doctor's vials, dashed it across the stage and began dragging them up and down his arms like he was scratching an itch. The crowd howled even when they dragged him off stage. Then they saw the blood pooling on stage. They still howled. Just different. He ran home and he told me that the syphilis had turned inwards and that the mad gods and the black titans were gnawing away at his mind and that I had one more duty. He handed me his Lady Macbeth stockings and begged me to strangle him. The men from the sanatorium were at the door. He begged me to help him. I couldn't. He tried to hang himself. He asked me and I... They dragged him out, clapped him in chains, shot him with laudanum, and they took him away. He was, was calm, without pain, but not funny. He was quite dead. He just happened to still be breathing. My father was the cup 
that held my life in one place. Now I pour out and I pour out. I am so dissolved in the wind and the rain that not one drop of me can find another one. The center has collapsed. The horizon has dashed hell below and stars above. I am unmade and unborn. Mr. Bullfinch, I need a father. Blackout and intermission. We'll take a five minute break. 